Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Juan Pablo Siles. Uh, I am the artistic director for Regiones. Um, Regiones is a free annual performing arts. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Juan Pablo Siles. Uh, I'm the director for Regiones. Got some technical difficulties here. I'm sorry about that. Um, we're a free annual performing arts series uh, based in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Um, we aim to present and uh, showcase the work by artists with roots in Latin America and in the Caribbean. Um, and I'm very pleased and very happy to have with us Candace Thompson Zachary moderating this beautiful panel of artists. Um, Candace is the founder of Dance Caribbean Collective. Um, Candace is currently based in Brooklyn, originally from Trinidad and Tobago. She's a dancer, choreographer, and cultural producer with a vested interest in Caribbean dance and culture. Um, Candace, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And um, yeah. Thanks, Juan Pablo. I'm really happy to be here um, and to be here with some of some friends in the field. Um, so I'll just introduce briefly our panelists today. So we have Alicia Raquel Bauman Morales, uh, who's a queer Oakland Boricua dance maker and performance maker and cultural organizer with roots in street dance, salsa and martial arts. We have Gabriela Berlsal, who is professionally trained in a wide variety of dance styles, which has resulted in a unique approach to movement and choreography. We have Fana Fraser, born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, who's an artist, performer, and director based in New York City. And we have William Ruiz, uh, who's a performance-based dramaturg who has combined artistic creation with cultural activism by developing platforms for artists interested in socially engaged experimental performing arts. So we have a wide variety of people from different parts of the movement, performance, um, theater making dance field. And with that, I felt that it was apt for us to start with some movement. So I'm gonna open the floor for Fana to just share something with us to kind of start us off um, with movement at the center. And then I'll let Alicia respond by sharing some movement of hers via video. And then we'll all reconvene to talk and chat and make this thing magical. All right, Fana. It's on you. I unmuted myself on, oh, I unmuted myself. Here's some feet, here's some feet. <laughs> here's my room, I'm just taking it on a spin, a little spin. Where's my family? Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Familia. <laughs> okay, now I'm spinning. Okay, dizzy, dizzy. Slow down. Oh. Thanks, Fana. Thanks for sharing that. I want to open the floor up for Alicia to share with us.
Thank you, Alicia. Thanks for sharing that. So I just want to bring everybody back if we're not all back already, so we can bring our videos back. Nice, just waiting for William and Gabriela to join us. Okay, wonderful. Okay, that was that was lovely. That was a treat. Um, so I'm gonna invite us to respond to each other's work. Um, and, and I can go first, like in Fanas, and these were just things that I, I wrote down while you were moving. Um, whimsical, joy, minimalism, simplicity, family, channeling of the human spirit and of the present. Mm. Um, yeah, Alicia, I'm gonna respond yeah. to that. Yeah, I really connected to what you said about the present. I felt that when I was watching you um, and it felt like a good dose of medicine to me to see you right in this moment um, come into your movement practice. Thank you. William and Gabriela? Yeah, um, um, also the, um, the feeling of present uh, was um, um, and something that, uh, that came through. And just a detail is that uh, it also made me think on how um, how our bodies also relate to the condition of, of, of this online uh, communication. So I really enjoy how you integrate like the movement with the with the with the transmission of the of the video. So yeah, the body was there uh, even with uh, like through this uh, with this medium. So thank you because it's also like a good uh, feeling. No, we yeah, we were like her partner. <laughs> and also how you relate to space and how uh, yeah, the, the movement of your body is, is adapting to all the different uh, of, of the environment that you're in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go to Alicia's. Uh, for Alicia, I have disjointed. I have um, expansive scenery. I have color blocking, I have environmentally driven, and then with the second video, slow, paced, careful, and personal. Fana? I think you're still muted, Fana. Unmute myself, the side-by-side. -side. The side-by-side -side videos were really, um, was really exciting to see. It's like, you know, the two, two sides, and the animated side I, I it was almost like a trip inside your brain a bit to see to see how does Alicia see i it makes me wonder how does Alicia see inside inside the brain yeah it was maybe a question yeah a lot of questions came up a lot of questions thanks Vanna mm -hmm. William Gabriela. Yeah, the, um, to have these um, uh, two images that were in unison, but at the same time, like have a different visual uh, treatment. Um, it was interesting because it's like having two sides of, of, of the same process at the same, um, at the same time. So they were very, they, they complement each other. Like I think in a, in a really uh, good way because it's, um, uh, it, yeah, these two different perspectives like created like a whole, uh, like in between the two, it created like a, uh, like another uh, level of experience. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you, it's, it's out there, Gabriela. You, nothing to add? I'll think a little bit. It's okay. Totally fine. Um, so yeah, thanks Fana and Alicia for just sharing. So improv in an impromptu basis, just to kind of get us started. I really like, um, you know, even with all these artist talks that are happening now, I, I just really like centering movement and centering um, the body and centering dance. Um, even though of course the, the idea is for us to share discursively, right? Uh, so the first question I wanted us to just delve into actually is really just talking give us a deeper introduction into your work and into your practice. Um, and now that we've gotten a glimpse for the two of you, um, you know, you can get maybe build on what you shared in terms of how it relates to your practice as a whole. Um, and then for William and Gabriella, just, you know, give us an introduction to 
your work. Um, I know I've read a bit about all of you and Fran and Alicia, I know you, you know, very well. So perhaps we can go with William and Gabriela first since we haven't gotten to see you move um, and then we'll go to Alicia and then Fana. We're both originally from Havana, Cuba. Uh, we moved two years ago to New York. Now we're in Miami. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm a dancer. I used to dance with a company. Then I left uh, the company and I started doing my own work. So uh, most of my work is, uh, I try to collaborate with uh, different uh, artists from different uh, fields. Uh, so I work with visual artists, uh, musicians, and I got together with William and uh, we started thinking about this um, a platform called Living Away that we uh, did a festival this year. So we did it online because uh, all the COVID-19 issue and um, we're working together and uh, we work a lot with other artists developing this platform and this festival. Yeah, and going into into our practice is um, is uh, about having um, hybrid modes of, of expression. Like um, we want to understand dance and uh, movement and also writing or dramaturgy uh, as not as um, bastard uh, uh, practices that are not. Um, um, just focus on a specific tradition or a way of, of doing it, but we like the idea that we can uh, cross um, and try to think writing uh, in terms of movement of body or of present and also to think on choreography in terms of gra 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 uh, grammatic or, or, or writing, like trying to move uh, those tools and trying to find like a common language. That's also why we collaborate a lot of, with uh, different, a lot of different artists because we believe that uh, there's always common ground that, uh, that we can find to um, participate so we don't have to be uh, isolated or uh, specialized. Like um, I, can, uh, I can move and I have developed also a movement practice and uh, Gabriela can also perform um, based on, on text-based uh, practices or visual art uh, practices, yeah. Thanks for that. Um... We are in reading some of your materials that, I, you know, it seems that you mentioned listening a lot. Um, and then what you mentioned just now about like choreography as drama, uh, sorry, not drama, as grammar, as a grammatical practice, um, as writing with your body uh, and the ways that you're seeing all of your practices, dramaturgy, performance based, um, as intertwined as part of a larger expansion of like an artistic practice as opposed to being like narrowly focused. Um, and in my research in, in Caribbean dance, I think the thing that has stood out to me is the fact that it's so interdisciplinary by nature. And that's like the thing that makes it so generative and open. Um, so thank you. Alicia. Um, hi, everybody. Again, my name is Alicia. Um, I'm a light skinned Puerto Rican woman and I use she, her. Um, I just wanted to throw that out real quick. Um, I, so what do I want to say about my practice? Hmm. Well, I feel like even before COVID, I was in a process of sort of coming back to why I do the art making practices that I do. Um, so I'm a dancer primarily. I also draw, I also write. So that interdisciplinary thing, when you said that Candace, my ears perked up. I'm like, okay, that's a, that's a through line maybe. Um, and I think I've been in a process of sort of, uh, yeah, returning to the essence and root of it for me. And what that means is discarding some things that I think I swallowed accidentally about what it means to be a, a good artist or successful artist. So, um, so my, my first dance practice really was outside. Um, and, and now it is again. It was, uh, you know, it's, it's always been its own thing, but it's very influenced by um, Oakland turf dance where I grew up and also by house and also by salsa and these different things. Um, 
Yeah, my visual art has not been something that I've created to put out into the world usually. It's been um, more personal. And I think it's been, I was about to try to say what it's influenced by, but really it'd be, that would be me guessing. Um, but it tends to be a little off kilter. It tends to be kind of like in the margins of things or, uh, yeah. Um, off -kilter. You know, I want you to say more about that. Yeah, what does off kilter, kilter mean to you? It means that I've never like sat down with a canvas, you know, um, it means that like my visual art practice really was in like the margins of my school notebooks and also on some surfaces I wasn't supposed to be tagging around my neighborhood, you know, that kind of thing. And um, uh, it's also been altar making. So altar making is something that that I grew up with and that um, that I still do. And I've kind of come to realize that that's a big way that I approach performance making. Um, so that's something about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I'm just struck by this idea of, of your like visual art practice in, in particular, and I guess how it also relates to your dance practice. Like, you know, your first dance experiences you're saying are outside, you're tagging, like your visual art practice is about like writing or inscribing yourself in places that maybe you weren't supposed to be, right? Like working from the margins as some people like to, you know, people talk about this thing about being in the margins, the people at the margins, um, and that being like where you've chosen to create, right? And like put it, put yourself or put your like identity or your output in those places. Um, it's like, I guess, really striking to me. So thank you for that. Fana. Hi everyone, again, I'm Fana Fraser. I'm from Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, I think today, I think, I think my practice, my work, I am always led by desire. Um, and I think it's been, uh, um, I've been doing this sort of tug of war with myself um, in terms of getting a plant I want or saying this thing that I know needs to be said, you know, or just, you know, the thing that's living inside. And then I question, uh, who does this thing that I'm, I'm feeling so much all the time? It's like, it's just so much all the time. And I'm like, this, is this all me? I don't think it is. Like, I don't think it could be. And then I'm like, maybe it is. And then like, who am I? It gets into all of these sorts of um, existential questions. Um, and it's always rooted, I think, in, for me, um, in the blood, in the earth, in where I'm from, where my people are from, um, my family and um, the families outside of my family that kind of create my community and my, my people pretty much. Um, yeah, the work, the work again, I'm coming to define as, as interdisciplinary, like everyone is saying, I'm like, oh, I'm writing constantly nonstop. I'm drawing nonstop. I'm like singing, like trying to find my tone inside of myself. I'm like, where is it? I'm like, I, sometimes I hear it. Um, and, uh, you know, you kind of let it all take you. I let it take me on a ride. I've been letting it take me on a ride more. I've been wanting to letting for all of this to take me on a ride to see to see what there is to see, I guess. Um, yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I make, a, I make stories. I make stories, I think. Sometimes um, they feel very present, but historical and maybe like glimpsing into, I don't know, I'm gonna get metaphysical, you know, like other dimensions perhaps. I'm like, where are we right now? What are we channeling? What are these, what's being called upon? How are we responding? Um, and yeah, you know, it's, you kind of, I have been allowing myself to be okay with the scary sides, the dark sides of the psyche, um, and getting more brave with my words and, um, 
sharing what's on my mind. So I think that's what it's when I'm doing, getting more brave with sharing what's on my mind and what's on my mind is in response to where I'm at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Fana. Mm -hmm. um, as we hear the motorcycles pass outside my house on Easter. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, I think uh, the, one of the things that stood out about what you said was in the very beginning, it's like being led by desire. And then how does that translate into uh, very mundane things, like which plant you want to buy, but then also into like larger political statements, larger political things with larger political stakes um, and like separating yourself from maybe the conditioning of the things that the like social constructs, the political constructs that are around you. And that, I guess like that's also part of your practice in a sense. Yeah, so thank you for sharing everybody. Uh, I just wanna backtrack and do a land acknowledgement. I am currently on the land of the Lenape and Canarsi people in Brooklyn, New York. I believe everybody here is in what we call New York City. So that's also the land of the Lenape people. Um, just because things started and then we, we got away from ourselves. So I think perhaps the next thing that I might ask us to respond to um, is two, well, two questions, which I think we can kind of tie together, which is what are some of the like leading concepts or philosophies or practices that drive your work? And we've already alluded to them, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about that. And then, um, a question that goes along with that, uh, what are some of the ways that your work has been misread or misviewed or misunderstood? And anybody can respond. Yeah, well, I just share, um, I'll share an experience and it's a very personal experience. I, I was um, in Brussels uh, doing a research on a dance school part there is um, a school very uh, focused on contemporary dance. And actually this idea that you mentioned of listening kind of emerged during that process because I entered a very specific world or, or environment of, of dance practice that is very, was very connected to this um, tra um, like postmodern tradition of, of um, European uh, or the European version of, of, of postmodern dance. And I felt um, like talking about this misreading, um, my reaction, my personal reaction at the beginning was to try to integrate to those, um, uh, to, to the ideas and try to, to be part of, of that community. And then slow, very slowly and with a lot of uh, personal, um, I won't call it suffering, but I will call it like um, violence, like a soft violence, but at the end um, it's uh, violence. I realized that um, I needed to go back and listen and listen also to myself and, and what um, where I came from, that it was Cuba, that it was a completely different um, environment. So it was hard for me to communicate. So my work or, or the ideas that I was trying to translate to that uh, all the world um, often uh, get uh, misunderstood because it came from a completely different uh, uh, route or a completely different uh, base. So um, I think it has to like mi mi misunderstanding because I, I'm interested in misunderstanding and that we all um, have a different idea of what, um, of what uh, we produce as, uh, as art. But uh, my, my issue is when that misunderstanding comes from some kind of colonizing uh, thinking. So we can all misunderstand each other. We can all try to discover what we really uh, want to say to, um, to each other, but we, need to be aware also of those power um, dynamics and, and understand if that misunderstanding is coming from something that will make us grow or something that is pushing us back. back. Yeah. yeah. Gabriela, you want to add anything? Mm. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, it happens to me a lot when I'm, uh, performing, um, the people don't understand, uh, 
where do I come from? Like that is a pro problematic for me because I um, like I have my, my dance language is uh, different from my uh, body, I don't know, uh, appearance. And uh, it's, yeah, it's always pro problematic because I was trained uh, in, in, with a technique that uh, has lots of elements of Afro-Cuban uh, uh, culture and music. And so I, one of my, my interest is in continuing uh, to, to, to develop that, that uh, those tools of uh, Afro-Cuban uh, elements. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think <laughs> the thing that's coming to me from what you're saying is is the fact that misunderstanding uh, is or like different interpretations of, of what we see or what we perceive are inevitable. But I think the, the violence or like the issue comes up when our perceptions of misunderstanding come from a place of trying to correct what you believe you see or you don't see you know what i mean so it's not like oh i can acknowledge this and realize that it's different from or that i'm, I'm having trouble understanding it in the way that maybe it's intended but that you believe that then you need to step in and correct or step in and um like place some kind of judgment on what you see or you don't see so yeah other folks so just to reiterate the what we're responding to are Tell us about some leading concepts or philosophies that drive your work and or some ways that your work has been misread. Yeah, I, I, the, what's coming to my mind now is this phrase that I've been using, um, you know, for grants and such is a contemporary Caribbean aesthetic. And for myself, I'm like, what does that mean? Like, what do you mean when you say that? Um, so I think that's that's definitely a driving, you know, if I had to break that down, contemporary Caribbean aesthetic. Um, I think that's what I'm, that's one of the things that I'm trying to do is to understand what that means for myself from someone who was born and raised in the Caribbean, um, whose family still lives there, who's you know, it's like my, that's who I am. That's 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 who I am. Um, Contemporary, I guess. I, I get. I love. I like that word, contemporary, because um, it feels, it feels ever changing. It feels. It feels like it could always be changing because it's always now. So it's, you know, it's. I'm just circling because it's a circle. It's just all circles. Um, it's. Yeah, I'm like, what does that word? What does that phrase mean for me? I think is. A driving question what does it taste like smell like feel like to myself other people how do we exchange what are the materials that we're using or not using what are the choices that i'm making or not making um my memory what are the things that i'm remembering what is it like to be in the diaspora you know what what does a what does that word mean for me and how how do i aim for clarity in my own definition so that um um, so that it maybe prompts prompts others to kind of question what it might mean for them or if they need to define it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm with that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I gave a lecture yesterday on Camille's platform. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that I talked about was the fact that at, at times this idea of people pigeonhole Caribbean dance in the past or something <laughs> historical or that's only relevant if it can like ethnographically represent how we have to live, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So it's like it's some in some ways like you having to say contemporary Caribbean is like an emphasis on the fact that we live today, we exist today and we have contemporary issues and questions and concerns that don't necessarily look like a PK step or a belle step, right? Exactly. Um, this is something that me and panel understand, but mm -hmm. um, I think your, your emphasis and then your, I guess your exploration 
of what that means to you is this like excavation of of self and of the experiences of other people who are living and breathing today so yeah i'm just like co-signing everything you're saying um we have some responses from the chat Maria Bauman, in response to Women Gabriella's statement, they, she says, yes, the difference between misunderstanding and imposing meaning and whitewashing. And she says, thank you for naming that tension. And then she offers, yes, correction or judgment. That's helpful language, Candice. Um, Antoine Bayer says, yes, ethnocentrism um, in response to some of what we've been saying. So thank you for that. Alicia. Um, yeah, that's so much food for thought for everybody and a big question too. Um, so thinking about the practices, practices and what was the other word you said? Um, I think so. I said leading concepts, philosophies or practices that drive your work. So work. Okay. Uh, so the altar making thing is one, mm -hmm. um, and sort of structuring performance as ritual, which is something I didn't really realize I do all the time until I watch some old performance footage and I was like oh okay that's been what it is and what I mean by that is using movement to shift energy in some way um movement and other kinds of art so I think one I think I always do that and two I think I'm becoming more aware of that being in the context of um Puerto Ricanness and Caribbeanness and sort of these bigger um, communal practices. Um, also the thing about being outside. So I've always, I've been a, a wanderer, a person who likes to be out um, since I was young. And I think that has to do with, I mean, it's, it, it has to do with wanting to get out of the house for different reasons. It has to do with growing up poor. It has to do with growing up queer. It has to do with, um, I think being uh, like rocking this tomboy look and presentation in a way that made it possible for me to move out in the streets with a little bit less um, constant interruption than I think more femme presenting people can get. Um, but that's been pretty essential always. And I think I'm starting to notice and name that. And because of that, um, I tend to have a, a really um, strong sense of relationship with the places where I am, like with the actual landscape. Um, and that feels, that brings me joy. That feels peaceful. That feels, there's something about that that feels um, central to who I am as a person and artist. So those things, oh yeah. And then going back so to that video that I showed and Candice, no, Fana, you said that it was like, you were looking at how I saw the world. Um, I think, I think one thing that I, that I just believe is that there are unseen worlds. So that there's the layer of the world we see and interact with directly. And then there's other layers of the world. And I kind of, I see people nodding. I think I kind of thought when I was younger that like, duh, or something. Like I was just raised, like I was just, you know, like that felt just like a kind of truth about the world. And then I got a little older and I actually remember this conversation with a white friend of mine who was saying, you know, he didn't believe in spirits and, um, and just kind of didn't believe in that at all. And that, and that, but that he kept hearing this from his Puerto Rican friends and was starting to be like, hmm, maybe there's like, maybe there's something cultural here. Maybe y'all have a different understanding. So um, that, I feel like there was one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is kind of moving into misinterpretation, right? Because I think just realizing, you know, the older I get and the more I experience different folks that like, my context and beliefs and um, points of view, they're not unique to me, but they are specific. So like that idea of unseen worlds, um, even just like what my experiences of race and class and immigration and queerness and gender are. Um, so yeah, so the unseen worlds is a big one. Oh, right, I remember, this is the last thing I'm gonna say about misinterpretation. So the um, view that I'm bringing to my work now uh, comes from this idea of storm medicine. Um, and I started thinking about storm medicine after Hurricane Maria um, and specifically after I started getting calls like San Juan's underwater and like we haven't been able to reach anyone in the barrio and kind of realizing the magnitude of what had happened. Um, so I, st I started this exploration and practice. And so the first sort of time I shared storm medicine, there's this piece 
huracan st storm medicine, which was that exploration. Um, there's this part that uses a cafe bustelo can. And so, and the can becomes, it bec it's like this sacred important object. It becomes a shell that I'm listening to. And then it becomes this way that I'm activating my body. So there's all this with the bustelo. So I performed it first in Queens with a very like Latino heavy audience. And people were like, hey, I see you at the Bustelo. You know, like, there was like all this call and response. There was all this recognition, like people connected to that. And then I performed the same piece in, oh, where was it? Montclair, New Jersey, um, for a much wider audience. And just nothing, just silent, like no call and response, no recognition of the Bustelo. Um, so I think that was just a moment where I was like, right, this is, this is specific. So I don't know what people, I mean, I don't know how people interpreted that, but I imagine like, what is that can and what does that have to do with the storm? You know, I don't know. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think I was, I'm still like laughing at that thing about uh, you being like, yeah, there are unseen worlds, duh, yes. Um, and I'm remembering, you know, this moment in grad school where I, we were reading, uh, this paper by Felwyn Sard, which is about the restitution of, of objects to African countries by the French government, like this movement to send back artifacts that were stolen during the colonization period. And, and the thing that I remember about the language that he used were, were the fact that he spoke about the fact that these objects had so much power in the African context, right? Like when in returning them, you're returning like a portal for people to, to use, to have access to again. Um, and the fact that in, in this like lengthy, like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 page report, he's like talking about the fact that, no, this, these spirits, these things are real. And like, it was a moment for me to realize that like in all of this stuff that I was reading, all these theories, like this was one of the first places where someone was just talking about the fact that like the ancestors exist, the spirits exist, these portals exist as fact, not as like conjecture or like, you know, your psyche projected. No, <laughs> this is real. We accept this as truth. Um, so yeah, I was just offering that in response to what you're saying, but um, yeah, thank you for sharing about this, this idea of storm medicine and Urakan and about the different concepts that drive your work. So I think I'm gonna pivot all of us um, into this question about uh, which, and again, we've already, we're there. So we're just diving deeper into how, how does the Caribbean appear in your work, right? Um, you know, we're all Caribbean artists, but at times like that, in labeling, labeling your work as Caribbean sometimes can have a limiting effect on your work, either for you personally or for people watching or the opposite, right? It can have a generative effect. Like people can see more into the work because you've labeled it as Caribbean or you can dig more deeply into your work because you feel like you have this expansive um, place and history to, to delve into. So maybe we can go around and respond to that. So to reiterate one more time, uh, how does the Caribbean appear in your work and is it a limiting or generative force for you? I feel like uh, for me, it, I'm like trying to think of the last thing that I was making. I'm like, what, what am I making? I don't even, I mean, my room, I guess. Okay, so um, yeah, I see, yeah, it's, it's all around. It's in the objects, it's in the food that I cook, that, that kind of gets me back to like, okay, how did I learn how to cook this? Who taught me this? Where did they learn this from? It's in the objects that are in the pieces. It's in the, it's in the way language appears on the page or, you know, like through the, through the body. Um, I'm like looking around, I'm like trying to look around to see it. It kind of is in me. It's like in how I do things, I guess it's, I don't know. It's just a, it's just a vibe. It's just, I don't know. It's just a, just a vibe that, that I know that I was raised, a vibe that I was raised in. One of the vibes, I guess. Now I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I really just, I think of the Caribbean as, as so many different types of spaces as a 
definitely as a psycho spiritual place, I think, um, is, is probably the driving force, um, where these spirits, this lamp is real. It's like, it is talking to you. It's real. Like the tree outside your window has the stories, like the anthill that you live on, like the communications, the connections, it's just, it's, it's in our blood. I, I don't know how else to, to say this other than um, that if it feels very generative for me to be able to to kind of, oh, I'm thinking of this book now that I have, Candice, I don't know if you know, See Me Here and Pictures uh, from Paradise. I, I forget the um, no, publishers. I yeah, beautiful. It's really, really just like a, a sort of reflective look at ourselves from our own selves. Um, yeah, and trying to, I don't even know what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's me figuring, figuring it out. It's us as island people, you know, recently independent from, you know, these the British crown in 1962. It's like your parents grew up under this, you know, and then they're teaching you. So it's like, how do I, how do I undo some of the things that I was taught, you know? Um, yeah, it's a vibe. I don't know how else to say that. All right, term for the day, it's a vibe. It's a vibe. <laughs> Uh, but I said, yeah, I like that you, I mean, you, you share two things. One, the fact that it's so generative for you and basically like it's, it is your being, right? It's, it's everything around you. It's your environment, uh, even though you're not there right now, but you can see it reflected in the spaces you create around yourself. But then also to the kind of um, like silent destructive forces that are also embedded in, in this experience that we have too, right? And that part of our work, or I'm not saying everybody's work, but some of our work is to um, investigate what those hidden residues are that basically like threaten our very existence. This like underbed of colonialism. So yeah, thank you for that. Oh, one of the things that I definitely want to stick to is to my roots because uh, I think they're powerful and they're part of my reality. And that's, that's an element that it's very important to always share your reality. Sometimes you want to do something else to, to be cool. And it's not like the, the point. It's better if you share the truth of, of yourself and of uh, your family, your country. And William and I have been working, well, we did it in the festival, Boheo. Boheo, maybe you can talk more about that, but Boheo in Spanish means uh, going around uh, an island. And it, all the piece like talks about uh, being outside and listening and, and observing uh, the things you know and uh, like finding ways to, to share it. Uh, I don't know, maybe you can talk mm -hmm. more about that. I'm like... Yeah, My. yeah. The, this this idea of Boheo, mm -hmm. um, because um, I um, like I completely agree with um, with Fana. There is um, uh, it's something that we cannot talk that much about because we we I think we are in the process of of trying to articulate that thinking from the from from the Caribbean because we've been uh, like. Um, our uh, education, or at least my, my education, is very dominated by Western uh, thinking and how to relearn or, or learn from uh, from that is to create like a whole body of thinking. Like you, uh, we, we are forced to, because we were given the tools that didn't uh, apply uh, to us, they were imposed on us. So we need to really rebuild from from the from scratch uh, a different way of, of thinking a way of thinking that um, that understand that spirits are real like without any uh, 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 without making it um, yeah like objective no. or like no qualifiers it's like no yeah <laughs> that is, is to assert that as um, as the basis in in how we think and uh, and from then from there start to to build like a whole way of seeing the world and i think that this piece that we that is a long 
term process. Uh, it's not a um, it's not a piece that is done and then we move to something else. I think we will be working on that for a long time because it's actually about that, like how we can reconstruct this idea of an island um, that is also part of the reality of, of the Caribbean. This uh, being a, a an, isl an islander. So um, this this boheo this this going around it has to do is also how we do we access that island like we cannot mm -hmm. just go in because that is that island is being portrayed in western or or uh, uh, through the lens of of someone else is how we can look at that and how, what do we get from that uh, from that experience and yeah I um, I really resonate with what Pana uh, uh, has been saying also in relation to not knowing, like the possibility I'm defending the, the, the not, not knowing because we, we, we've been, uh, like those tools have been taken away um, uh, from us. We need to remake them. No. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'm shouting out Maria Bauman. She said two things. Uh, so wonderful when our scholars name our reality in their language, not that we need scholarship in order to be made real, but it's certainly affirming. Um, and then, uh, woo, <laughs> so much artwork from being resourceful with the tools one is given that don't apply. So I think that's responding directly to what you just said, William. Um, Alicia. Yes. Um, can you repeat the question? I was feeling yeah, what y'all yeah. were saying, but I lost track of the question a little bit. Yes, yes. Uh, do you find the Caribbean a limiting feature in your work or a generative force? How does it appear in your practice or work? Yeah, I feel like all the things I've been talking about around frame and practice are pretty Caribbean. Um, I would never say that the Caribbean is a limiting force. I would say that colonialism and racism try to be, you know, so, um, yeah, Puerto Rico as a current U.S. colony, you know, there's um, there's a whole set of dynamics there that I think I'm will probably be a lifelong practice of um, understanding and unpacking. Um, one thing that comes up for me is as a diaspora kid, um, a, a theme that came up in in the first storm medicine practice a lot was language and translation and Spanglish. Um, and I started thinking in this way um, towards the end of that process about Spanglish selfhood and kind of the, the mezclao, like the, the blending of, um, of language and, and flavors and place. Um, and speaking of scholars, got to, got to read some things, some articles around, um, specifically around New Yorican identity and kind of stages of how that becomes. Um, and so, so in going to Puerto Rico and performing a piece of huracan storm medicine, um, it be, so sort of like naming my Spanglish became this um, important thing um, of showing up as I really am. And I think what that meant was letting go of this idea of that I should speak in a particular way to really belong. And so, so I was on that trip very much like, y'all, I speak Spanglish, it is what it is, here I am. And, and, and then all the people that I was interacting with at a certain point were kind of like, well, so do we. Like, we're a US colony and people have been going back and forth, like the la yiving, the back and forth is this rhythm with Puerto Rico and probably not only, but definitely with Puerto Rico. Um, and that like all those dynamics like Spanglish and, and that, that idea is um is is not it's not unique to me it's not unique to people who are born here like there's something about puerto ricanness that i think that speaks to um so it's generative once i was able to like deal with who i am and how i really talk then it became generative and when there was shame around it it was more of a block yeah thank you mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think that that's kind of why I introduced that question, because I know, you know, I've been <laughs> as somebody who was born in the Caribbean who lives here, you know, I would I would meet people and I'd be like, oh, OK, so, you know, like the question would go to like, so where are you from? And then they were like, yeah, well, I'm Caribbean American or you know what I mean? Like they're like, yeah, well, no, I'm not Caribbean. I'm Caribbean American. Like they have to differentiate 
that they were born here, but they have West Indian parents or Caribbean parents. Um, and then some people kind of, I guess, like apologize for that. And I've been in the habit of being like, okay, like, I'm not here to like measure how much Guyanese blood you have in you, like where, but I think that, you know, in all of my conversations is about, it's about those shared things that we share, like you're born here, you're born there, like, sure, there are differences, but there's also so much, again, generative, so many things that are generative from that shared experience that we can build on that we don't need to look at like, okay, that inch of difference that you have, like, I don't, like, you don't qualify, or, you know what I mean? Um, so I just, I like that term that you introduced, like Spanglish selfhood. Um, and yeah, just identifying that your experience or lived experience as being a Puerto Rican person that lives in the US, mainland US, is different from the Puerto Rican person who's born and raised in, the, in Puerto Rico, but there's there's no standard that we need to be measured against, right? So uh, just introducing that. As we are winding down, it is now 2.54, miraculously, the time has flown by. Uh, so I'm trying to think of a, a closing thing that we can respond to. So there are two things. One is, uh, I know that there are some of your artworks on the website, on the Regiones website. So maybe you want to share a little bit about those pieces, if there's anything you want the audience to know about them. And then in closing, anything that you are, that is like really present for you in your reality right now or in your work right now. Um, I guess like thoughts that the audience can leave with that might be useful for them. So the work on the website and what you're thinking about. I'll go. The uh, work on the website is um, I have some doodles that I've been, I just, you know, just doodle on my phone, on my notes. I, um, my notes are now extremely organized. <laughs> They're like thought categories. Okay, this is what I'm thinking, you know, this topic, this topic, this topic, this topic, this topic. Um, and um, so it's some of the drawings are some of the doodles that are from my phone, which look different from the doodles that are on like a page um, that I do. So there's some doodles. It's just basically stream of consciousness, like whatever's on my mind at the moment. Um, I do have a um, practice where I use both hands. So I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm writing with both hands or, or my non-dominant hand. Um, and that unlocks, I mean, it unlocks some really wild stuff that I'm like, I know I'm not making, the, I could not be making this up. I'm not making up this information. It's just, I'm just channeling it pretty much. I don't, I, this has to be real. You know, I, I cannot doubt. Um, what else is on there? There's a, uh, yeah, so those are the drawings. And then there's a video from a uh, process uh, in 2017 um, at Man C for the inaugural choreographic lab, I think is was the name of it. Um, and what I had been, the title that I was working with, um, I mean, this is a piece that I probably really need to go back to and I'm just gonna read what I wrote about this. Um, so the title is No Talking While Eating Fish, A Bone Will Stick in Your Throat. Um, and then I have a sermon, a story, a study, a speech a slippery shape shifting song of songs of shamed desire fueled by blood and rage, rage and a mortared pound of salted flesh, a slow remembering. Um, so if you, it's, if you have 10 minutes, I invite you to please go see what you think I might be talking about or what it brings up for you. Um, and what am I working on right now? I'm uh, doing a full spectrum doula training. I've been thinking of birth postpartum doula work for the past decade. Um, and now I was like, now is the time. This is the sort of work, supportive work um, that I feel like I need to be, that's where I think I will be most helpful um, in the community is helping uh, people birth babies 
that, you know, across the spectrum of privilege and experience um, and place spent. Um, and I think I'm like, okay, where is the best place to begin? It's in utero. Um, and I'm like, okay, that's probably where I need to kind of begin to direct some of my energy. Um, not other places, but yeah, doing doing some in the full spec, you know, just all of the doula, doulaing, helping, supportive service work. Uh, so that's where I'm at. Thanks, Fana. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that out loud that it's 2.59, so we may go over five minutes um, for us here and also for our audience. Uh, Alicia, work on the website. What do you think yeah. about that? Thank you. Okay, so on the website, I have, I have these four drawings um, that in my mind, I, I think of as the crowning series. So I started making these in late February and then into early March. Um, and sort of had all these like synchronicities with crowns come up for me. So I looked back at an old dance video that was this practice called Be the Soul of This Place. So back in 2014, I was dancing on a street corner and trying to like feel the place and, and partner with the place. Um, so realizing, okay, I've been doing that for a minute. But in that video, there's this graffiti red crown over my head that somehow I didn't notice for <laughs> years until recently. Um, so that popped up. Um, I started doing these drawings Corona, Corona virus hit, and that became this sort of resonant, mm -hmm. weird synchronicity for me. Um, and thinking about the process of being crowned. Um, so that came up and then around the same time, because of this popping up, I got really interested in Basquiat, Basquiat's work and the crowns that show up there as a, you know, a, a Caribbean artist, a Puerto Rican and Haitian artist. Um, so, that is some context for those works. Um, and then I'll say what I'm up to right now. So I'm in, I'm in a process that I'm in my mind calling uh, coronacion, storm medicine. Um, so looking at this moment and, and, and the storm of it and, and what is the crowning that maybe is happening or has the potential to be happening. Um, and at this, so I'm in rehearsals with people and I'm outside and I'm doing all this stuff. In this very moment, I'm in a slow your roll moment. And shout out to my mentor, Sharon Bridgeforth on that. Cause she, in her very smooth, gentle way was like, so do you need to know so much right now? And I was like, all right, maybe not. So, so right this second, I'm kind of in a, interrupt the momentum, know a little bit less, mm -hmm. shake it up and see what's going on uh, moment. Thanks, Alicia. I like that. No, a little bit less. <laughs> yep, I vibe with that. Uh, Gabriela? Oh, uh, yeah, well, we have um, on the website is, uh, begin well, it's what we did in the festival. It's part of uh, what we started to do in the festival that is also a, um, a work in progress. It has to do with the idea of Boheo and how this boheo that we started uh, uh, in Havana has uh, evolved and adapted to other circumstances. Uh, for example, a boheo now um, means going around and resonating with the internet because uh, <laughs> we <laughs> were going around the internet all the time, especially in these times in this time and um so yeah. yeah maybe yeah it's um yeah we'll talk a little bit about the um, concept of, of boheo and this um a uh, like long-term research that we all uh, developing based on that uh, on that idea and yeah on the website um there is um some uh, of our reactions to the internet as Gabriela um, uh, mentioned so it's um, basically two two of two sides of that um, um, uh, research or that um, yeah travel around the internet a uh, one that um, that is um, based on 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 certain representations of, of femininity on uh, on the internet but also trying to reclaim that and and making it um, like um, something away from from becoming like a a, a product or just uh, something to to consume and and get like reclaim that 
And it, what I'm um, showing there, it has to do with um, um, uh, something that I'm uh, looking at that it has to do with this um, instructions, uh, instruction or not an instruction, but uh, didactic videos on how to um, do knots or how to, uh, that has to do also with uh, survival. And in this time, like, I think it's, uh, uh, it's something that has been exploding, but uh, trying to see in there uh, something like an artistic dimension of it, like uh, not 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 only for uh, it could they could be used to for people to learn uh, something, but it can be also um, a way to reflect uh, and a way of, of of talking about more universal um, uh, ideas. So I'm in there. You you'll see the some. Um, uh, an image of, of myself uh, doing some knots. That is something specific as a practice that I'm I'm, tr I'm trying to develop. Like the knot as um, as a place where different things come together and like they they tie, and also the complexity of the knot. That is not uh, uh, something that you can understand at the beginning, but you can you gotta do it and undo it to to be able to. Yeah, to understand how it works and how uh, what, what is its complexity. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to that, not knowing, going back to that, like in between space. Yeah. So that seems to be our concept that's coming up for a lot of our works. Uh, I just want to read a comment by Beatrice. She says, uh, "Yes, this is it true? I'm Cuban American, even though um, I'm not born in in Cuba. There's a shared and lived experience that made sense to me when I went back to Cuba to meet my family." The calling of going back home erased the confusion of proving to be, trying to prove to be 100% Cuban. So affirming you, Beatrice. Um, I just want to thank everybody for sharing um, so generously with us today amongst each other and then with our audience. Um, and I'll turn it over to Juan Pablo in case he has anything to say before we close. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, Candace, thank you. This was a beautiful conversation. I really appreciate the... Um, the questions and really the, the conversation, what I take from it is just uh, the vulnerability of everyone in this time and just the vulnerability also of being an artist and um, learning, unlearning and experimenting. And I think that's very true to what we and Rick Jonas wanna do. Um, so I really appreciate each and every one of your works. Um, I wanna invite everyone that is watching this to please uh, check out the website, check out the artist's work and support them in any way that you can. Um, you know, we, we are trying to create a platform to further any work uh, that these artists do and um, we really value uh, their artistry. So we have some, uh, we have a publication that we released. It's a magazine with some augmented reality uh, stuff in there. We're going to be at Maria Hernandez Park today. If you happen to be in Bushwick and want to social distance and get a copy of it, um, please come over, join us, uh, say hi. It's very small. We have a small tent, but it'll be fun. And then later tonight, we're going to have an outdoor screen of some films. Uh, Natalie Arazzo um, put a beautiful program together of three uh, wonderful filmmakers. So we have a shorts program that's at around 840, also near Maria Hernandez Park. So if you're around, want to, you know, breathe some fresh air and uh, walk around, uh, get away from the um, your apartments, then please, please join us. Um, once again, thank you. Thank you, Candace. Thank you, William. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Fana. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, Monica and uh, uh, Glashanda for um, helping us uh, interpret this and making this uh, a little bit more accessible. So. Thanks everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed.